Right. Um, in your book, you talk about this new opportunity that was born within the last 20 years, uh, in even just the eight years since we've been doing online marketing and, and since artists have, were forced onto MySpace. Um, you say the opportunity for small businesses, in our case, independent artists, um, to sell what no one else will sell and engage in the way no one else will engage. And you say three things that I think are critical for you all to understand who are watching this. This is the really the first time in history that you can reach your potential tribe members, and Seth can talk about what that means, organize them in whatever way you see fit, whether it's on Pinterest or Twitter or on your Facebook pages or through your blog or through taking photos of them, and then do business with them. And that's, again, the piece that we see missing all the time, even the artists that are beginning to understand how to get social, how to engage, and how to do it well. They're missing the business piece. <laughs> and I think uh, part of that is the business is, is a bit gone, right? We're not selling CDs anymore. A lot of us don't quite understand about how to create new products and services and goods for fans. Um, can you give us some examples of some artists or businesses that you've seen doing a kick-ass job with that? Let's start with this. You used to, a musician in 1970 or 80 or 90 was looking for a job. And the job was to fill a slot in the store. So the record label would hire musicians. Don't even imagine that those guys were independent. They were hired by record labels, paid up front, to make the song of the week or the song of the month. And if it sold, then they got to do it again, right? And that slot filling activity is what sort of created our vision of what the rock star does. Well, now there are no slots left because mm. there, there's no retail left. So please understand there's more music than ever before, more opportunity than ever before, but the music industry is dead. And so what you actually do for a living now has nothing to do with what Neil Diamond did for a living. Mm -hmm. What you do for a living is you lead a group of fans who want you to take them somewhere, and who want to hang out with the other fans. Those two things. So the Grateful Dead is the model. They are the Apple computer of the music industry in that they did it right and consistently and became a legend. And I can give you 50 smaller examples. But what the Dead said was, all the music is free. If you want to listen, it's our privilege to play for you. But if you want to hang out with the other Deadheads, did I break something? Nope, we're good. Okay. I think it's if you want to. If you want to hang out with the other people who like our music, that costs $30. Mm -hmm. And so they put on a party every night for 10,000 people who each paid 30 bucks. That's $300,000 a night so that the 10,000 people could come together because there was no other place they could do that. Mm -hmm. So my friend Moby makes $200,000 on a good night by himself putting on a party, right? right? You can hear his music all you want without him. But if you want to be in the room with the other people, you got to have Moby there too. And so Keller Williams, also worth Googling, Keller has put up all his music online for free. He's extraordinarily talented, a very generous guy. He can fill a room any night he wants, anywhere in the United States. He just emails the list and they all come. That's his job now. Not to fill a slot, but to lead a group and to connect them. And if you're not prepared to do that, then I think you should not try to make money as a musician. If you're not prepared to do that, the only other alternative is to make your music, put it online for free, and go do a day job. Hmm. It's funny you mentioned Keller. I used to work for him when he was first signed. And there was something about Keller, and this is another point that Seth talks about and something that I preach as well, that Keller Williams is remarkable. The man and just his guitar with what he's able to do, the reason why he had success that's still building 15 years later is... He is thrilling to watch. For any of you who don't know who he is, Google him and watch some of his videos. He was a sensation because he's so amazing. So I think the cornerstone of all of this marketing is you've got to make sure you've got something so good that people want and spread. Um, and you talk a lot about that, Seth, in pretty much all of your books, that unless people are passing on information about you, what you do, who you are, you're really dead in the water. How do we overcome 
what might happen if we put something out into the world and it lands and flatlines? Well, of course it will. How is that not possible? You know, the guy who invented the ship also invented the shipwreck. You you can't you can't say I want to be an artist, but I never am willing to fail. Everybody, every art, you know, there are unsold Picasso paintings lying in garages, and there's albums that Bob Dylan made that got him booed off stage. You know, if you want to be great, you have to be prepared to fail. If you want to be mediocre, you can be consistently mediocre and never fail. And those are the two choices. Um, I'm not going to try to persuade you uh, that you um, are great because you are. That's why you already showed up at a conference like this and why you've already put your work out there. What I need to persuade you is that part of being great, the price of being great, if you will, is you have to be prepared to fail, to be booed off stage. If you're not, then you're not going near the edge. And if you don't go near the edge, then uh, you're boring. And if you're boring, we're not going to talk about you.